Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us this evening on this lovely Veterans Day. We got beautiful weather today for our parade and for our celebrations. My name is Roseanne Santos. I am the Director of Alumni Engagement at John Jay College. I've been at the college for 10 years, but I've been in this position for three and it has really been a great experience getting to know the college's alumni and working with them uh, to help you learn more about whatever their expertise is in. Tonight's event is a collaboration between myself in alumni relations and annual giving and my colleague, Richard Pusateri, who I'm going to ask to say a few words before I get the panel discussion going. Okay, well, happy Veterans Day, everybody. I'm Dick Pusateri, the Military and Veterans Services Manager. Uh, I know the interest both our students, our alumni have. Uh, we have just esteemed and experienced people who can talk to us. So let's do it. Let's figure out how this veteran and law enforcement thing happens tonight. Thanks. Awesome. Well, this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing a John Jay alum, Mr. Bray Barnes. It was him who brought this idea to me. And I'm very grateful to him because it makes my job easier when alumni want to dive in and volunteer with such robust and dynamic ideas and panel discussions and topics. And his colleagues and friends of what I can tell has been a long time have been so gracious to be here with us this evening. Um, Bray has been an attorney for more than 30 years in New Jersey and Washington, DC. And he's currently the Managing Director and Vice Chairman of Municipal Finance and Service Corps. He's also a member of the Board of Governors, Global Society of Homeland and National Security Professionals. He's, he's a busy guy. He serves as a Senior Advisor to Global Security and Innovative Strategies in Washington, DC, which is a security consulting and business advisory company whose principals are primarily former senior executives with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. When I tell you it's so important to network with your alums, Bray has put himself out there for us, and I hope that you will take advantage of getting to know him and listening to what our guest speakers have to say today. So without further ado, Bray, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Roseanne, and uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, the uh, John Jay College uh, Alumni Association and the uh, John Jay College uh, Veterans Affairs uh, for allowing us uh, to be here with you this evening. I want to echo uh, Richard's uh, comments also uh, to all the uh, current active duty military and veterans who are out there, uh, and on behalf of myself and our panel members, uh, uh, thank you for your service today on this Veterans Day. So I'm very pleased to uh, be here with uh, two of my outstanding colleagues. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with one of them for well over 20 years. And then uh, Jay Corey is a, a new introduction, but uh, when you hear from him, uh, just uh, a, an outstanding individual. So uh, we're very pleased to uh, be here, here uh, to be with you this evening. And without any further ado, uh, you've heard about uh, a little bit about me. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to these guys and uh, let them tell you a little bit about their background. So uh, Joe Arata, uh, let me start with you, Joe. Thanks, Bray. Uh, good evening, everybody. Happy Veterans Day uh, to you all. And thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, it's an honor to be able to spend some time with you. Um, I started my military career as, as an enlisted infantryman. I was a border gunner. Um, decided to be, go to the dark side, become an officer, went to uh, I, I, um, ROTC at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. I spent most of the time in airborne units, um, most of the time with Fort Bragg, the 82nd Airborne Division. I did two tours uh, in Combat 1 in uh, Operation Just Cause, the invasion of Panama, as well as um, Desert Shield, uh, Desert Storm. Uh, when I left service, I... Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, when I left service, I actually went to corporate America uh, while I was trying to get into law enforcement. And I was right on the cusp of age, uh, if you will. I was 34 years old and 37 was the cutoff. So there was this cusp of, do we want you? Do we want to take a chance? But I had to work. So I went to corporate America. Um, but post 9 11, I was finally given the opportunity to uh, get law enforcement because the age was different for the Federal Air Marshal Service and uh, became Federal Air Marshals with. Uh, Philadelphia field office, uh, served there for just about six years. Um, did, I was both a flying fam as well as an operations and intelligence officer. And when I left there, I was also the assistant um, squad leader for our, our operational squad. I left there, uh, went to 
Customs and Border Protection to take up uh, the role as the Assistant Director of Recruiting, primarily with the U.S. Border Patrol and the, and the Air Marine Operations uh, Organization. I left CBP as the Director of Recruiting and moved over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement where <clears throat> for seven years I was the Chief of Recruitment and uh, Retention. And now I serve as the Deputy Assistant Director for the Office of Leadership and Career Development. Uh, one of the uniqueness in my career is I've both been both a gun carrier and a uh, sports service in law enforcement, but my career has been law enforcement for, uh, for 20 years. Um, and I've seen both sides, both aspects of it. And I think that brings a different perspective because there are a lot of opportunities for folks, uh, not just in the gun carrying positions, but also in sports services, in computer forensics, uh, our cyber world is exploding, but uh, intelligence and a lot of other opportunities as well. So I um, live down here in Northern Virginia and uh, work in DC. And the uh, um, proudest thing of my life is I have a young son and he's also now a young paratrooper at Fort Bragg um, uh, in the same uh, regiment that I served in. So thanks for having me, and I will pass it on to Jay, I guess. Hey, uh, again, I'm honored also, like everyone else, happy Memorial, happy Veterans Day. Uh, Joe and I have a very similar career, except I didn't go over to the dark side like he did. Um, <laughs> um, I, start, I started right after high school. I went into uh, Special Forces at the time. Uh, back then in 1982, they were accepting people right off the street to go on in. It was a great gig for them because you get 60 privates joining special forces. Only five of us passed and everyone else was worldwide assignment. So it actually uh, worked out well for the military. Uh, stayed there for four and a half years, got out, went to college, um, got my bachelor degree and then uh, was lining up a job with the ATF and the ATF would only give me a GS7 at the time, a GS5 or a GS7 at the time. And I go, look, I got all this training. I got this Halo school. I got BNOC. I got ANOC. I got all of these schools. And, and you only give me a GS7. They go, well, if you had one year grad school, we'd make you a GS9. And it really put it in perspective, you know, my military career, how important college was. So uh, Gulf War broke out. I put the ATF on hold and I went back into the military, uh, served in special forces with the military making it all the way to Delta Force for the last three and a half years of my career uh, as a 18 series, uh, Special Forces series Intel person. Uh, got out, uh, worked with my brother and my father, and then ended up purchasing my own McDonald's in 1998. Um, was very happy there. And like Joe, I mean, my years were, I was past 37 at the time. Uh, couldn't be in any other career. My, you know, law enforcement was 37. Well, you couldn't be in it. And then I uh, was happy in my McDonald's. I was looking to buy a second store when 9-11 happened and ended up selling the store and becoming an air marshal and worked my way up from there. And now I'm a senior executive with the air marshals out of Newark, New Jersey, where and I currently live in Jersey. Uh, that's my whole career to date. I'll turn it over to the panel now, I guess. Good. Thanks, uh, Joe and Jay. Uh, very much uh, appreciated. Um, just to uh, pick up... Uh, one of the things that we'll make sure that we do as uh, we talk about, um, oftentimes you're going to hear acronyms, especially, uh, you know, prior military or military, uh, you'll hear various acronyms. Yeah. So uh, we'll make sure that uh, we fill everybody in what they mean. Uh, one of the things that Jay uh, uh, alluded to was the uh, GS uh, uh, series, a, a five, a seven and a nine. The uh, yeah. GS scale is the pay scale in the federal government. So uh, basically a five and a seven is the entry level positions. So uh, that's what uh, that's what uh, Jay was referring to. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, Roseanne gave you uh, some uh, brief highlights as to what I'm doing now. But uh, previously, um, I uh, uh, served in law enforcement uh, after graduating the uh, State Police Academy in New Jersey. I was on the job for about 11 years, um, seven on the road, and then uh, spent four years as a uh, county detective uh, in New Jersey. Uh, later on uh, in my career, I went to the um, uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, when we stood that up, uh, I served in a position, what they call a uh, senior executive service or SES, which on the military side is equivalent to a um, 08 rank, which is a two star rank. Uh, while I was at uh, DHS, uh, I was director of the uh, first responder program. Uh, we were interfaced with all of the uh, state and local uh, first responders throughout the country. Uh, subsequently, I served as the acting chief human capital officer uh, for uh, Homeland. 
where I was responsible for all of the uh, human resources management for, at that time, our 210,000 employees uh, uh, throughout the, not only the United States, but uh, globally. Uh, during this period of time, I uh, served as the uh, chairman of the uh, DHS Law Enforcement Council, as well as the uh, First Responder Council. And then uh, later on, I served as the uh, director of the National Sheriff's Association, uh, the Cybersecurity Institute. On my military side, um, I was on active duty with the United States Army as a radio operator during Vietnam. Uh, later went to um, OCS, the Officer Candidate School, graduated as Distinguished Graduate, uh, was a motor platoon leader, um, and then uh, ultimately uh, uh, discharged. And uh, I still uh, uh, maintain uh, my relationships uh, with the military as a, I'm a life member of the 101st Airborne Division, as well as the uh, Vid Vietnam uh, Veterans of America. So that's my background. Uh, as, uh, as many of you can see, uh, uh, Jay and Joe uh, have uh, both a, a good stellar background in both military and law enforcement. So let me start off. Um, uh, you gave your highlights of your career and uh, your background. So uh, Jay, I know uh, you sort of uh, talked about it a little bit uh, that after you got out of the military, you went uh, private sector and then went back in. But uh, why did you become uh, a Leo? What was the uh, driving force that uh, made you become a law enforcement officer? Well, what happened is 9-11 happened. And uh, after 9-11, back when I was in uh, Fifth Special Forces Group, we were active. Uh, we trained the Afghanis back then. Um, we, we trained them off-site, uh, overseas. And after the 9-11, I got called up by DEA because um, I was a reservist. I'm still in the reserve, but I was a reservist working for DIA, and they asked me to come on down there. I went down to DIA, and then, you know, you got to put it in perspective. My heart was, you know, when you own your own business, it's all encompassing. It's everything. I mean, you can't, if you're going to the beach and your phone rings and it's work, you can't not answer it. I mean, someone has your wallet in their hand, you know, so you never get a break. And then, you know, I, I served there until December of, of uh, 2001. And then when I came back, I had a call from a friend who goes, Hey, Jay, the air marshals are recruiting. I said, he goes, I know you're not interested, but if you know anyone that's interested, let me know. I go, well, I'd be interested, but I'm 39. Well, they put a waiver in up to 39 at the time. You couldn't be 40. And so I said, all right, I sold the store in January. I joined the air marshals and I, you know, I told them I needed this much to be able to make my bills. They gave me just that much. And, you know, that's, that's how I ended up where I am now. You know, um, it was based on 9-11. I haven't looked back. It's a great career. Uh, sometimes I look back saying, where would I be if I still had the store? Probably a little heavier. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I haven't looked back since. And, and the air marshals have been good to me. I mean, I've moved eight times, but uh, every time I moved, it was in New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania. My commute got longer, but I never had to sell my house. And I never work from home, so I don't have a home office. So that's how come I'm in the kitchen. So I apologize for that. <laughs> well, it is dinner time, so uh, we yeah. uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Joe, uh, you know, you, uh, I guess you went right into the military during college. Uh, so then after the military, uh, what was the uh, contributing factor of you getting into uh, law enforcement? Actually, I, I'd always wanted to get in law enforcement. Even when I was in the military, I'd started playing the, uh, the groundwork for it. Um, as I said earlier, the, the issue for me was I stayed a little too long. So just like Jay said, I was 34. I had applied to the FBI and a couple other law enforcement agencies. And quite frankly, at the time, the process was so long that they said, hey, you know what, great candidate, but you're not going to make it by 37, because the FBI at the time was taking about two and two and a half years to, to, go, through, to go through the process. Um, so as Jay had somebody call him and say about the Air Marshal Service, mine was a little different. Uh, my four-year-old son was at his first soccer game. It was actually the Saturday after 9-11. And he said, you have, Dad, you have to meet my... Uh, my coach, he was in the army and I went over and met the, co met the coach and he looked at me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm in corporate America. He goes, have you ever wanted to be in law enforcement? I said, I have, but I'm, I'm, you know, 39. And by the way, just a side note, Jay and I were the two oldest people in our <laughs> academy class. Okay. So I had to be by about two months. So we were the two uh, oldest people in academy class. Uh, but anyway, he said, uh, here's my address. Come bring your resume. And he was at the time, the number three guy in the federal air marshal service. So my four-year-old, who's now 25, likes to remind me that if not for him <laughs> playing soccer, I would never have gotten into law enforcement, which is probably true. So anyway, so I got to be able to achieve my goal even at a, at a pretty, you know, mature age. Um, and, uh, you know, it was tough. 
being 39 and going into an academy with a lot of folks that were either cops or just out of the military. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's really how I got in. And, uh, um, even when I took off the gun and, uh, to go into the other side of, of law enforcement, um, one of the things I've learned is this is my, this is my community. I've never wanted to leave law enforcement, no matter what job I've done in the government. Um, this is where I work. This is, this is where I feel comfortable and the community is, is important to me. Um, so this is where I'll retire from. And, and I'm happy I got into it. And so unfortunately for Jay and I, it was a tragedy of 9-11 that gave us the opportunity for law, to, to get into law enforcement. Um, but um, out of that, you know, we, we got the opportunity to do something and go back to serving our nation. And, and I've never looked back. Well, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Jay. Obviously, uh, I'm going to date myself now because uh, mine uh, was a little bit different, uh, you know, certainly prior to 9-11. Um, mm -hmm. When, uh, you know, we came back and got out of the military, uh, you know, after Vietnam, um, you know, we all looked around and said, you know, what are we going to do? So uh, myself, like a lot of the guys that uh, I served with, uh, we all uh, said, well, what skill sets do we have? Um, so, you know, you looked at uh, everybody looked at law enforcement and law enforcement was the job to uh, go to from uh, the military at the time, regardless of what your uh, military occupational specialty was or MOS in the military, uh, we went over into law enforcement. You know, you saw the, uh, you know, the drill and the ceremony, the, uh, the uniforms, the, uh, the uh, skill sets that you had, the training. So they seemed to uh, best fit and to translate into the uh, uh, law enforcement community. So that's why a lot of us uh, did at that point in time. Uh, this is back in, uh, you know, the early 70s that uh, we said, OK, well, that seems to be the best career move for us. So uh, most of us uh, entered into, uh, you know, the academies and went into law enforcement. And I got to tell you, I, uh, you know, I did a lot in my career, uh, as uh, you heard Roseanne say, uh, I've been, you know, I was an, an attorney in Washington and New Jersey here for well over 30 years. And somebody said about going to the dark side before when I went into law school, most of the guys I worked with said, you're going to the dark side, you're becoming a lawyer. But, uh, you know, my 30 year career in, uh, in, um, as an attorney, I could say I always look back on my experiences as law enforcement, and that's what I always relate to. Uh, you know, I've been very proud of uh, my legal career representing uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, state troopers, uh, you know, PBAs and FOPs during my career. And that's what I look at the most, uh, that, uh, you know, the guys and the gals that uh, serve in law enforcement every day. Uh, that to me is, uh, is very meaningful. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about our skill sets uh, and Jay, I know, uh, you know, uh, being, a, you know, an SF guy, Special Forces guy and Delta Force, uh, you had a lot of different skills that you learned in the military. What did you find uh, most useful for you when uh, you came out of the military and then went into law enforcement? What uh, translated over there into the, uh, you know, the law enforcement community? Well, I, I will say that, you know, it's not, the most important things I got out of the military, and I see it because now I'm in charge of people, I bring in new, new candidates. The military provides you with a work ethic and integrity and, and a sense of honor that a lot of people don't have anymore. And, you know, when, when you're in law enforcement, you're on the giglio. And I know you can explain that better than I can. But if you lie, if you're caught in a lie, you'll lose your job for a simple lie. Uh, and so you see the, the, the work ethic that you get and always willing to put in those extra hours because law enforcement, it's not a nine to five job. You know, I mean, my air marshals are working all different hours. I was just down in Fort Dix today visiting my guys and girls who are working 12-hour shifts down there with our Afghan allies. Um, and the integrity and the honor you have really does build a camaraderie that you don't realize until you leave service. Now, law enforcement's a little different than society because if you look around, it's only 4% of Americans are U.S. veterans, only 4%. Now, we're in this community, so we don't see that. So when I was in McDonald's, I saw it. I saw how few military veterans were in owner operators and managers and things like that and in corporate. But once I came back into the military, the, the number of veterans in law enforcement, I mean, excuse me, once I came back into law, once I went into law enforcement, you have a higher percentage of, law, of military vets in law enforcement than you do in society. Uh, and the reason for it is, yeah, you could have any skill in the military, but the most important skill you're going to develop is the work ethic and integrity, in my opinion, on that. I don't know, Joe, or you have anything to add on that? Yeah, what do you think, Joe? So a uh, couple, couple of quick things. One is leadership at all levels. 
that it's not always the person mm -hmm. in charge that has the bite the best solution. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were always, you know, leadership was always pushed down in the military, and sometimes the lowest lowest ranked person came up with the best idea. And uh, I still to this day adhere to that. You know, you listen to everybody. Somebody's got to make the decision. We know that uh, that's in the military and law enforcement. Sometimes it's a quick decision. Sometimes it's a little bit a little bit lengthier, but um, it's not always the person with the highest rank that has the best uh, decision or best best advice for the decision. So leadership at all levels. The other thing too is is uh, looking beyond today. You know what? You know we in the military we used to break, break things down to current ops and future ops. What are we doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? That's kind of current ops and future ops is where do we need to be? And that affects training. That affects resource management. Uh, it affects um, education. Uh, you know, that in training and education are two different things when, when it come, comes into, uh, in my mind, into learning. So, you know, I, in my job I'm in right now, that's one of the things I task my uh, folks with all the time is how are we planning for this week, but how are we planning for six months from now? And that was something I absolutely learned. And then on top of all that, it sounds crazy, but an after action review, um, look how, how did we do things? What do we do right and how do we sustain it? What do we do wrong and how do we fix it? They were all lessons. And we can talk leadership and we can talk shooting skills and fitness and all that kind of stuff. But looking at the organization while you're in the organization, even as an individual, as well as a leader, you know, what, what, are, what am I planning to do? What did I do right? Where can I improve and how can I uh, get better in my job? And, and those are all things that were daily operations in the military and you did it without thinking uh but to to jay's point you know i went to corporate america you know just like jay did after after the military and i was the only i was the only veteran in my office and i was in two different uh offices and nobody thought that way nobody thought about it was either you know it was the vp of whatever was the one making the decisions never pushed it down no but no way planned further out than you know the next sales cycle and things like that but it was just so ingrained in me and it's helped me be successful in my 20 years in law enforcement. So let me ask each of you a follow on question. You know, Jay, obviously, uh, you're a supervisor now and you're in command of a number of, uh, you know, folks. Um, Joe, you have been in recruitment on, uh, with CBP and, uh, you know, with ICE. Uh, you know, you, you see the young folks coming in now with, uh, you know, prior military into law enforcement. If somebody wanted to go come out of military and get into law enforcement today, you know, what do you see that's different than when you guys are in? And, you know, what advice would you give them? You know, I'm coming out of the military. I want to get into law enforcement. How do I best prepare? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm due to transition out. So what would you think would be your best advice to them to prepare to get into a, a law enforcement career? Joe, let, let's start with you this time. OK, sure. First thing I would tell you is MOS for military occupation skill or military skill doesn't matter. Um, you know, we always hear, I was an MP, I was a security force person. So, you know, that's the best person for, um, for the job. Quite frankly, we find a variety of, of skill sets coming out of the military that are quite, you know, in sync with what we do. So MOS doesn't matter. If you're a uh, radio operator, right, like you are, you know, um, doesn't mean you can't be a good cop. Um, so, so it's really about your, uh, what you want to do. Uh, what you want to put into uh, going into law enforcement and the effort you want to put. Uh, second thing, and I think probably the most important thing and the thing that frustrates uh, veterans is patience. Uh, the government, well, especially the federal government, but I, I, I don't believe state and local are much different. It takes a long time. You're going to go through a lengthy background investigation. And I, and especially on the, you know, on the law for the federal law enforcement side, you know, that can take up to six months. So, you have to have patience. Um, you, you cannot expect to apply for the job and be walking into it um, the, uh, the next day. Uh, another thing, and I think that I found this uh, often, because um, I also ran all the, the veterans programs in both of my or organizations, is, is a little humility. Um, I often heard folks, you have to give me a job because I'm a veteran. No, we have to give you a job because you're qualified for the job and being a veteran helps in that assessment and your ability to accomplish the, the, the job. So um, humility in, in, in that process goes a long way and people take themselves out. And I'm, 
not just talking about veterans. We have also other law enforcement officers who do the same thing that they think they deserve something and, and everything is earned. So much like the military, you earn your rank, you earn your schooling, uh, you earn your positions, uh, you know, place in law enforcement is something that's earned. It's not, it's not given to you. Uh, persistence is you have to stay in the game just because somebody says no this time doesn't mean you don't go back and say and and ask for the yes again um and, and along with persistence and the last thing i'll bring up is variety of applications apply 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 okay uh if you want to be an fbi agent that's great that's your first application that's your focus apply for three other agencies one state one local and one other federal agency uh, as well, because what you want to do is start your career, get the experience and start moving towards what your ultimate goal is. And oh, by the way, you may find out that you're having more fun working at the DA than you are than you would have at the FBI. So variety of applications uh, is important because what you want to do is start building the skill set as soon as possible. And a friend of mine put in for the bureau. That's all you want to do is a bureau. And I was an air marshal with him. And seven years later, the bureau still had not had him pick them up. So imagine if he didn't have a job, if he had not gotten into law enforcement, that would have been seven years waiting for his dream job. So, uh, you know, apply, 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 make it across law enforcement spectrum, and it all adds up. It, it builds most of the people I work with uh, in my organization all started as local cops or somewhere on the border. And uh, the investigators, almost all the investigators, where local cops or state cops first. So um, it may be your dream job, but get, get a job first to get into, into the profession and then, and then you start making your own plans to go forward. Uh, let me, uh, Jay, if I can, let me just jump in and just to add some real quick uh, th thoughts on that. Um, you know, Joe, uh, I, I hear you and, and uh, you know, I echo a lot of your comments. Um, you know, uh, when, uh, when I was uh, the, uh, Chief Young Capital Officer for uh, DHS. A lot of folks wanted to come in either to the Secret Service or to ICE or to CDP. And um, I tell them, you know, apply. We you know if you want to be a Secret Service agent, what we used to call a, a, a grade 1811, uh, which is a uh, investigative officer. I said, you know, get into the program. You know, it, once you get in, it, you may want to be a Border Patrol agent or you work in a local law enforcement agency. You know, once you get in there, that skill set then makes it a lot easier then to start transitioning over to other opportunities that may uh, be provided in the uh, federal or state or county governments. So, you know, to your point, Joe, I absolutely 100 uh, percent agree. It's, it's the type of thing that get into the system first. And you may find out that, you know, it's the program that, you know, you always may think that the grass is always greener on the other side. That, uh, you know, gee, I, I always wanted to be a, a Secret Service agent. But you may find out that the job that you land in maybe state and local government uh, or in another place in the uh, federal sector is the job that you said, hey, you know, I'm really happy that I'm here. And, uh, you know, this is the job for me. So, you know, my advice, everybody is, you know, just like Joe, apply. Um, uh, you know, we've seen it. You know, I've seen it. I talk to the guys, uh, you know, on a regular basis in New Jersey. You know, uh, you know, with COVID and budget cutbacks and everything else, uh, you know, the academies were scheduled and they weren't scheduled. Then they were scheduled and they weren't scheduled. But a number of them uh, went into other law enforcement agencies. And, uh, you know, they're thankful that they did because uh, it took quite some time for everybody to come back on scope and to make sure those budgets were in place and uh, to, you know, maybe get the job that they ultimately wanted. But in the meantime, a lot of them stayed where they were. So, uh, you know, get into the system. Uh, you know, apply, to, as Joe said, uh, you know, get on the job. And then, uh, you know, once you're on the job, you can always take a look. And you may find out, as he said, that, uh, you know, the dream job that you thought you wanted uh, is really the one that you ended up with, uh, you know, in the, in the first place. So, Jay, any thoughts on that? I mean, you're supervising people. You know, you got young guys coming in and gals coming in all the time. Yeah. And first, I want to echo, I mean, the foot in the door concept in federal law enforcement, don't underestimate that. And and when you're preparing, like Joe said, start preparing 18 months out, start applying a year out uh, because it does take a long time. The other thing I will say is, and Joe alluded to it, don't underestimate someone who doesn't have military experience when you're in training and things like that also. Uh, because I mean, when I went to Joe and I were in the same course, we both got hired, I think January 7th of 2002. 
Uh, we all went to training together. It was an 18 week course. Uh, it was mostly military, but there were some non law, non, um, there were some, some local cops there. And some, I, I don't know if we had anyone with either military or law enforcement. I think there was one or two people who had neither of those experiences, experiences in just college. And we all formed a team and we helped them out. I mean, uh, Joe was surrounded by three NCOs, an NCO from the 82nd, another NCO who I served in Somalia with in Delta, and then, and then Joe. And, you know, so we would help the, the, the guys and girls who didn't have military experience and the old officer, which who, who, how I refer to Joe, along along the way. And, you know, and Joe being the typical officer would take credit for what we did, but we didn't mind it because we all, <laughs> we all appreciated him and we all formed a team back then. But uh, even nowadays, when I'm, when I'm working with people, I mean, the military people come in much better prepared uh, than everyone else, uh, without a doubt, even the local law enforcement uh, who aren't used to the travel and things like that and the deployments and any federal agency you go to, you're going to have a bit of travel. Uh, the other thing I would prepare for is that you're not going to have this laid out career path as you do in the military. Um, you create your own career path. I can honestly say, and Joe can attest to it, I lucked out to be where I am. I never really planned it. It just happened. Um, but you really got to plan your career path once you're in law enforcement. Uh, but like, uh, like we said before, once you get in law enforcement, you plan your career path out. They're not going to do it for you. But to get there, foot in the door concept, stay positive. Don't be negative. Practice your interview skills because your resume is one thing, but the interviews you go on are going to be critical. So go on as many interviews as you can and get those interview skills up. Even if you Go on and interview, you look up interview questions and have someone ask you those questions. Uh, that's an important aspect, too, uh, because in federal law enforcement, for some reason, it seems like that interview, they base a lot on that interview. So uh, just prepare for that also. That's all I have on that. And Brett, Brett, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, please, Joe, jump in. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing Jay brought the interview, too. When I talked about humility earlier as well, you know, one of the things I've sat on a lot of these interviews, we don't want to hear a lot of bravado. Um, th th that will get you less marks than, than high marks um, because it just it's, it shows a little bit of insincerity, quite frankly, uh, when you come in and go, oh, well, I was this and I was that. You know, you're, you're going up against everybody even when you come into that interview. And um, th those questions are designed to look for specific type of things. And everybody has a different set of, of interviews, but we're looking for something specific. Um, so don't be, you know, like I did this or, you know, I was better at that and all that kind of stuff because it really, those things kind of stand out. They want to hear the answer to the question. Um, and it could be, you know, it's, it's going to be stuff like give me a position time when you were in a difficult situation, you had to make a quick, a snap decision. What did you do? How did it come out? Okay. Answer it the way that was asked. Don't, don't throw out, well, you know, I was this and I was that. Just give them the answer. Um, because it actually gets you a lot further in the interview mm -hmm. than if you're kind of telling stories. Yeah, and no. be, oh, go ahead, sorry, Jack. go ahead. No, no, and please, be, Jack, go ahead. And be detailed. Now, there's a fine line between bragging uh, and <laughs> not providing enough details of what you did. So, uh, and Joe's right. There's that fine line that you have to hit because that's going to be critical because if you don't answer it, enough and they have to ask probing questions you know you're going to have to have that line where you're you're comfortable talking about yourself but you're also the credit the deferring credit to the team and how everyone supported you and you supported everyone else because you don't want to go in there saying i'm a great leader but in you know you also have to be a great follower um and that's one, another aspect that you get from the military, too, is you get both of those where you put positions of leadership, but you also have to follow. So those interviews are real key. And like Joe said, um, don't brag, but also don't talk enough about in details of what happened and what you did and how the team responded to fulfill the question, too. Uh, thanks, Jay. You know, I'm just going to add one other thing in here, maybe a little bit off the topic, but, you know, we're talking about interviews. One of the other things, uh, you know, when you when you go for an interview, this should go without saying, but let me say it uh, because, you know, I've seen it time and time again. Be truthful. Be truthful. When you guys when people get in front of interviews, uh, they try to figure out they, they're trying to think of what the interviewer wants them to answer. 
but don't think for a minute that, you know, if they ask you a question, if you had a, you stumbled somewhere along the line, you know, if you had a, uh, you know, a DUI or, uh, you know, uh, whatever the case may be, you know, if, if that was a problem that you had in the past and it's long since gone, uh, you know, but tell them, you could, the most important thing that you can do is, is be absolutely truthful. It's worse that if you do not tell the truth, then to tell the truth and to own up to it. So as you answer these questions to, you know, Jay and Joe's point also, make sure you tell them the truth. Make sure you tell them the actual situation and don't try to guess because that could hurt you more than anything else. Uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's been a teenager. Everybody's had growing up pains. Everybody has, has had right to passages uh, throughout their careers. And, uh, and, you know, if there was some issues in the past, uh, make sure you're, uh, you're very truthful, especially in law enforcement. When you get into law enforcement, that's, that's the killer. If they can find out now that you're trying to scam them or you're trying to get over on something, that is an immediate, uh, you know, dismissal or that's immediate, you know, push this resume aside because he's not going to be one of us. So as you go through these interview processes, make sure that, uh, you know, <clears throat> your answers are, are truthful and forthright and own up to it. And, hey, I made a mistake. But, you know, since then, uh, you know, uh, that that was a growing pain and, and it's long since beyond me. And that's mm -hmm. that's received much better than to try to mask it over. So let me uh, let's move on. I mean, I think we've uh, talked a lot about the uh, interview process and, uh, you know, going from military into law enforcement and uh, this, uh, the, that process itself. So, uh, you know, we've talked about some of the uh, skill sets that what trans, uh, you know, what uh, transcends over into uh, the uh, law enforcement community from uh, the military. If there was anything, I mean, we've talked about the leadership, we've talked about the camaraderie, uh, Jay, uh, you know, the eight, the being a, a team person, uh, a military uh, a component that clearly gets into, uh, you know, the law enforcement community uh, that, uh, you know, you're a team. And uh, regardless of what your skill sets are, everybody brings skill sets. Uh, you know, you're part of that team and, uh, you know, your work as a team. But was there any particular type of uh, training that you could look to in the military that you felt that has now been useful to you in your law enforcement career? Uh, Joe, to you. Okay, so first thing I'll tell you that still is with me today is fitness training. Um, and I still, you know, that is still something incredibly important, important part of my life. Um, as even as I get older, um, being, being fit and being in law enforcement should be hand in glove um, for a lot of reasons. It's not just the physical part of the job, it's also the stress of the job uh, and the resiliency that you need in the job. So I, I and, and Jay, I think would agree with that too. Being fit in this job is important. And guess what? It's on you to do it. Um, there, you, know, you may have to take a PT test once a year or once a quarter, whatever your law enforcement agency requires. Uh, but I will tell you that <clears throat> getting into a fitness routine that I learned in the military um, to this day has, has been able to keep me to sustain the stress of everything that goes on in, in law enforcement. And there's, a, there's a lot of stress. Uh, all you have to do is watch the papers or read the papers or watch the news and, and you understand your stress. The, but the other thing I want to talk about too is, is uh, the joint operations training. Um, you're never going to do a lot or not never but you're not going to do a lot of things in law enforcement that alone so you have to understand other agencies how you have to coordinate with other agencies what their left and right limits are what your left and what right limits are um, learning how to work with folks outside of your specific unit that i that you know and you know being in the dark side as an officer jake I had to learn those things, right? <laughs> you know, how, how to talk to the Air Force and how to talk to the Marine Corps and the Navy and, you know, how to talk to other units uh, within the Army and pull the plan together. You'll be doing that on task force. You'll be doing that on um, any type of intelligence operations. You'll be doing that literally in resource management, too. I mean, that's a discussion. You know, I, I, I help run the, our leadership training. That is across the department what we do because it's resource heavy um, and we try to see where we work together and what does CBP do that we do that we can we can do jointly. Um, so I, we can get into schools and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and I think all the schools in the military lead you somewhere. The things I took away from it, you know, that, that really resound with me is fitness and, uh, and knowing how to work across uh, with other organizations uh, to, 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 to complete the operation. Jay? 
Uh, agree with Joe, uh, and and the military training is a lot like what Joe said with with your degree. Uh, anything you take that challenges you is going to benefit you. Uh, any military school you can get, or, or your MOS, I mean, what Joe mentioned, and any MOS the, military, the law enforcement is looking for. But any any training you can sign up for, get. And I say that because you don't know where your career is going to head. Uh, you know, I'm an air marshal right now. Uh, Joe was an air marshal. We were both very happy. And I'll tell you, we were both in training together. And uh, the oldest guys in, in the class, and we we were smoking people. We were taking, you know, we were we were ahead of everybody. We would, you know, I mean, I tease Joe a lot, but he's been a best friend of mine for twenty years and two months. Uh, it, it's it's been an incredible ride with him because it's the bond we build during training. But any any school you can get that challenges you is going to make you a better person. Because don't forget, yeah, there's there's police, there's law enforcement, there's intel. The FBI has a surveillance unit. There's I have a, a buddy who was an air marshal with me. He now works for commerce and he's on the tech end of that. So he's an agent, but he handles the tech part of that. So you don't know where your career is going to take you. So wherever it's going to take you, just be prepared for it by getting every bit of training that you can get. There's nothing, there's, you know, there's no school that's going to be beneath you because you never know where you're going to end up in life. Um, but, and, and the military training, you know, we go through it and some of it's challenging and some of it, eh, it's not that good. But when you leave it, you're like, and you go on a civilian side, you realize how good that military training is. At times, you don't appreciate what you have until you don't have it anymore. Good. Thanks. So I guess the moral of the story is uh, take advantage of uh, whatever opportunities you have in the military because, yep. A, you never know where it's going to take you and B, Regardless of where it takes you, uh, you can always find that it's going to have uh, some impact on your career. Good advice. So I, I, we did have a question that was popping up, and let me ask, uh, let me ask this. Uh, we have a question. Um, fellow's in the reserves, and he's applying to get into uh, law enforcement. Should he stay in the reserves while he's applying to uh, get a job in law enforcement? And if and when he gets into law enforcement, should he stay in the reserves? Jay, I'll start with you this time. Uh, I'm still in the reserves. Uh, it makes it a bit more challenging. There are, um, but it, it's still, I mean, as long as they're willing to work with you, I would stay in the reserves until you get the law enforcement job. And then once you have the law enforcement job, they, they, by law, they will be required to, to give you the time to, to um, serve and do the things that you have to do with the, with the reserves or the National Guard. But only you can decide whether it's worth it. Well, I mean, I, I'm still in. I'll have, uh, I retire next December from federal law enforcement and from the military. I'll have uh, 22 years in the FAM service and I'll have 34 years in military. Um, I got out of the military reserves for about a year and a half and went back in because I do enjoy I do enjoy it. So I would stay in right now until you get the job. Once you are in, the law enforcement, uh, I would make look and say, can I do both? Uh, it's a personal decision. There might be a time where you're building your career up, where you want to get out because you want to focus on what you're doing in law enforcement. Uh, on the other hand, only you know what's best for you. It, there's other people who will say, stay in until you get a family, then get out because you want to have more. You want to have more time with kids. Um, there's no definitive, there's no one right answer for that. It, it, it all depends on you. I will say the wrong answer is to get out before you line up your law enforcement job, because like we were saying, it could take years. Um, and then when you're in, you know, it's like any military course, you know, I mean, there were a lot of people who went through training with me in special forces who were better than me, but they got an injury here or there. And the injury could set you back. And so, like I said, is, is, is I would keep the, the reserves or, act, or National Guard until you get in. And once you're in, make the decision from there. Good advice. Joe, uh, you've been in recruitment uh, for a long time. What would you be your advice for somebody in the reserves and uh, National Guard? So, so along the same lines, Jay, you know, I would stay in. Um, I would also be cognizant of the fact that there are some, at least at the federal level, I, I can't speak for state and local, of that do not allow because of the nature of the uh, position do not allow you to be in the reserves or guard. Um, and I, I don't know them off the off hand, but there are some that um, refuse to give you that because of the nature of the, the sensitivity of the job they're in. 
Um, there are some financial advantages to that uh, when you get to retirement. Um, so that's something to think about as well. Um, but quite frankly, it's about, to Jay's point, it's about workload. Um, our agency, uh, actually every agency I've been in, in, in law enforcement, uh, strongly supports uh, folks in the, in the Reserve and Guard, uh, giving them the appropriate time to take off um, uh, for their missions to, to include deployments. Um, we take extra special care of folks that have been deployed when they come back. They go through not just a transition with the Reserve and Guard, but they go through a transition with us too. So they're, they, they're brought back in a, at a pace that that's, uh, helps them uh, readjust. Um, but it is, you know, law enforcement's going to take a lot of time uh, for out of your day. Um, and, um, and, and I know the Reserve and Guard takes a lot of time out of your day. So um, it also has a lot to do with what you're doing in the Reserves and Guard. You know, I, I, we have a guy in, in, in our agency who's a one-star general in the Reserves. I can imagine that that takes a lot of time out of, out of his day, as well as being an agent for us. So, you know, that's time management and it's what he wants to give up um, to, for, for that career. Um, so I, I would definitely stay as long as you uh, feel um, you're comfortable doing it. I don't know about the National Guard. I was only in the reserves, but um, I, I know that you, you used to be able to come off active reserve status and went to the IRR. That's an option as well if, until you get to a position that maybe you have some more time. Um, but again, once you get into, at least in the federal law enforcement side, there are some uh, retirement benefits being both a, a government employee and, and a member of, of, of the military reserves. Hey, let me add one more thing on that, because Joe brought up a really good point uh, about the workload. You know, just a little bit about me. I made E7 in seven years, which was a very, I mean, it was unheard of back then. So in se by seven years, I was in E7. I mentioned I have 34 years in. So 27 years later, I'm still in E7. right? And I, I am that because, you know, with my leadership style, I have a lot of empathy and I, I, I try to get engaged with people. I couldn't, if I couldn't take a first sergeant position, I couldn't take a sergeant major position with the job I have. So I stayed happy as an E7, as a worker bee. In fact, I had, I, I was given right now I'm in a, a death five supporting Jack UCOM. It's the first first sergeant position I'm taking. It's because it's the final year and a half of my contract. And I was asked to do it by a Colonel I respect a lot. So I'm the senior listed advisor, but it's only a unit of 20 people. And I'm handling that now but I'm an SCS, so it's a little more challenging for me. And I could not have done this if I was in E8 20, 22 years ago. There's no way I could have, I would be in the position that I am uh, because of the workload that I would have had between being a supervisor in the Federal Air Marshal Service and then having 50, 60, 70 people to care about in my reserve unit. So uh, Joe mentions a good thing. It's about the workload also. Yeah, let me just uh, tag on to that a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the things I found, uh, you know, after the military, uh, you know, I went into the Guard, um, had, had enjoyed my time there. Uh, but, you know, when I was when I was there, uh, we were working rotating shifts. So, you know, one week you're on midnights and, you know, the next week you're on days. And, you know, if you're married, you're raising a family and then you have a job. And then, you know, if you go back to school and you, you're still in the you know, Guard or the reserves, I mean, there's a lot of juggling. So to Jay's point, I think everybody has to find their own level to find out what you're comfortable with, um, you know, what uh, what you can handle, uh, if your uh, family life will help support that. Uh, so those are all the types of things that you're going to have to take into consideration. And, and, and to Jay's point, again, I think it's going to be probably on an individual basis. You have to find out, uh, you know, what's your tolerance level on, on all those types of things, what becomes most important to you and, you know, what what do you, how do you see as those uh, priorities? But clearly, uh, definitely stay in the regard of the reserves uh, during your time uh, until you, uh, you know, finally uh, land that job in uh, law enforcement. So we've talked a lot about, um, you know, your careers in law enforcement and uh, your background in the military. Um, since you've been in law enforcement, did you find that uh, there was anything particular since you've been on the job that um, that skill sets that you learned in uh, in your job in the military that has uh, uh really helped you out in, in your job as, as a police officer or you know, a law enforcement official? Or is there any particular skill set that you said, yeah, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, I had this particular skill set and, you know, that's transcended over into the, uh, into the law enforcement community now. And uh, in the job that I do, uh, that, uh, you know, has done very well. 
I, I, I give a real quick example. Uh, you know, in the state police, they have uh, what they call the teams guys. Uh, those guys are, you know, equates to a, a SWAT team. Uh, these are the highly specialized folks. So the guys that are there, uh, a lot of the skill set they learned in the military, uh, you know, whether it was the, uh, you know, the scuba diving, uh, the underwater demolitions, uh, you know, the uh, repelling, um, you know, the uh, coming down the rope uh, out of a, of a military aircraft or a helicopter, whatever the case may be. They found out that a lot of those skill sets uh, particularly uh, were very useful to them when they apply for teams and uh, they went over into the teams unit. So that was one of the things that I've seen that uh, some of the guys, uh, you know, in uh, state police, for example, uh, were able to uh, take some of those particular skill sets and uh, were uh, selected for those types of things. How about uh, Jay and Joe? Uh, did you find anything particular that uh, worked well when you went into law enforcement? One thing Joe? I found... One thing I found out that didn't work well was jumping out of airplanes. There was no role for that. And, and I, I couldn't understand that, but there was no role for that um, in, in, uh, in the military or in law enforcement. I, I will tell you the thing that I, I've used the most um, is crisis management, stress management, whatever, whatever you want, want to call it. You know, we get called on to make decisions quickly, um, almost on a daily basis, whether it's employee issues, it's, um, operational issues, whatever. Um, the, the, the lessons I learned, the training that was given to me in the military on, um, first of all, handling stress, um, managing people in a stressful situation, um, and uh, being able to make uh, good judgments and good decisions in the middle of all that chaos, if you will, crisis, um, it is invaluable. I mean, on a, literally on a daily basis. Um, you know, one of the things we used to do in, in the 82nd was you jumped, you got on the radio, and somebody comes on and goes, "Hey, guess what? Your company commander is dead. You're you're the company commander now. You, so you've been trained for your part of the mission, and now all of a sudden you've got you own everybody's mission in the company. So, um, so you know, long and short of it is." you're under a lot of pressure and you got 30 minutes to do that job and to, you know, give the ups to the, to the commander. Um, I, I, I make those kind of decisions on a daily basis. Um, and, and that's, you know, and um, removing obstacles for folks to, to help them make the decision as well. So um, you, you, we can talk about fitness, we can talk about operational planning and everything like that. But the thing that really sits with me every day is, is managing crises and manage, and managing them well. Well said, Joe. Thanks. Jay? Without a doubt, Joe hit it on the head. And the other thing is adaptability and leadership. In, in at least, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, Joe has more experience in, in federal agencies than I do. We both have the same number of years. I've been in one agency and in TSA, TSA overall uh, and federal air marshal service. But they don't teach you leadership until after you get promoted in, in law enforcement. And I, Joe, I don't know if that's the same over there. I know you have a great leadership course over there, but I think it's after you get promoted, you go to those classes. So the leadership classes you get in the military by far are, are some of the best training you will get. And the other thing, and Joe said it best, is the adaptability. You know, you go on in, you know, hey, now you're the company commander. You know, I first came into the Air Marshal Service. I was a flying fam. And then they needed someone in training because they were starting up Newark and, oh, Jay, Delta Force, Special Forces. Well, they had a Navy SEAL working the training thing. So they said, ah, we're going to put you in the operations department. I knew nothing about the operations department. And next thing you know, I started working in that section. And between me and the, the training department, we ran the best office in the nation. But it's being adaptable and being flexible and not having such tunnel vision on, no, I'm training. Now, eventually I got training supervisor when I was in New York, uh, but I'm known throughout the FAM service as an operational background now instead of the training background. Um, but like I said, it's life takes you funny places. So just go with the flow and do the best you can, no matter where you are. But the leadership classes in the military really are going to come in handy because those are the things that are going to make sure that you understand how to lead and how to follow and do the best in everything you can do. Good advice. Thanks, gentlemen. So we have uh, a couple of minutes left um, in uh, about uh, a very quick summation, 30 seconds. So we have folks that are uh, attending John Jay College. They're looking to go into law enforcement. 
Uh, any particular courses you would have them take a look at? Uh, it's coming out of the military that they would uh, look at it, John Jay, that uh, you would feel that would be very helpful for them to uh, have a law enforcement career. What would you recommend? Uh, Jay, 30 seconds. What do you think? I would say anything in law, writing is a very big one also, and communication are critical also, communication skills. So I would say those three, and a fitness skill, uh, any fitness classes you can get also in, in, in addition to your major. Joe? Uh, computer sciences, cyber, forensics, anything in the cyber world, there's not an investigation that starts yeah, yeah. today without yeah. uh, a cyber data point. And also, if you're going to want to get an investigation, some type of financial understanding, because Bitcoin, uh, dark web, moving money on dark web is become a huge investigatory um, uh, imperative right now. Um, so it's great. We can all get criminal justice degrees and all that kind of stuff. But get some things that are going to put you ahead of your, your peers, uh, understanding what type of investigations and, and work, workplace um, uh, challenges you're going to have when you get into those investigations. Joe, Jay, thank you very much uh, for uh, a great panel discussion. Uh, to all of those who have been listening, uh, my, uh, again, uh, my thank you for your service on this Veterans Day. And uh, if you're considering a law enforcement career, uh, I think uh, to each one of us here on the panel and my colleagues, we highly recommend it. Uh, if you haven't picked up by now, uh, the friends that you make in law enforcement, they say you're friends forever. Uh, Joe Arada and I have known each other for over 20 years and uh, still I know I could pick up the phone at any time during the day and talk to Joe and uh, if I needed him, he'd be there. And as you heard from Jay and Joe, they went to the academy together and that friendship still, uh, that bond is still there. So. It's one of the finest uh, programs. It's one of the finest uh, careers that uh, I could select. So I highly encourage you, be patient, um, weather the storm. And uh, if you get into law enforcement, uh, I'm sure you'll never regret it. So thank you very much, um, Angela. I'll give it back to you and uh, alumni relations and uh, veterans affairs. Hi, that was an amazing conversation. I learned so much. Um, and I'm gonna take a little bit of my privilege because I know a lot of people will watch the recording and I'm gonna ask one more question. I'm gonna, if you don't mind, if you have five minutes for me. Um, and I wanna ask what is happening in these spaces to bring women in, in terms of recruitment, diversification. Um, all of the audience was male, all of the panelists are male. So I would like to kind of put that out there for our folks who watch the recording about what are the efforts that are happening out there for women who want to go into these professions. Um, if anyone feels comfortable answering that. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, okay. About two years ago, and I don't know how I got elected, but uh, I got elected for the women's executive at the Federal Air Marshal Service. I love it. So it was, I was on the board there and we actually just finished doing a retention survey uh, for, directed for our female fams uh, because our female fams and our, our, our service uh, make up about 12% only of the, of the law enforcement in there. And we do have recruitment drives out there, but uh, we did a retention survey. This is, a, this is the second one I've run. Uh, and from that, we formed a number of different working groups that will uh, are put in place to assist with retention and recruitment of, of female federal air marshals. Uh, right now, TSA is looking at that retention survey and how well it was received. Um, we just got it back, we're going over the data. I work with a phenomenal board. The board chairperson now is Alana Bell. And so we do have the systems in place to recruit. Um, the other aspect is that, you know, I mean, especially when you have a female boarding the plane as an air marshal undercover, fortunately, they can disguise themselves a lot better than a brute looking like me. You know, if one sees me, they're like, oh, yeah, look at that guy. Um, so it, it, there's a great niche for female federal law enforcement officers and a great niche for female fams. Um, I will say one of the best fams I've run across has no military experience, no law enforcement experience, but was a, a bartender and a CrossFit person, but she has the ability to people watch and spot those skills and use those skills. And now she's been picked up by headquarters and is doing phenomenal down there also, all through hard work, dedication. Uh, but we are looking to recruit more and more females. So uh, because of the fact they make up such a small population of the female, of the federal law enforcement uh, for the fed, uh, 
for the, for the uh, air marshals. Uh, and there is the, a group that we have that's looking into that. Well, if you'll allow me to tap you a little bit in the future to perhaps come back and do uh, a webinar around what's happening within federal air marshals around this recruitment, maybe in conjunction with our career center. Um, yeah. You know, I'm putting you on the spot, right? But you can tell me no, it's okay. No, no, I, I, I will yeah. do that. You know, I, I look, if, if anyone wants advice, you can share my contact information with them Thank too. You. Uh, you know, I, I'm here to support veterans and I'm here to make law enforcement better and to recruit the right people and offer people the right, the opportunities to come on in and, and serve their nation and continue to serve their nation. Mm -hmm. I think is, is, you know, it's, it's one way I want to go out in my career is helping others. So yeah, I'd be interested. In and as a side but, note, it's pretty cool. I've never met anyone who's owned a McDonald's. So cool. Yeah. Hey, can I, can I, can I put a plug in? Yes, for us as well? please. Because one of the last things I did uh, as the head of recruitment was um, get authority from the office of personnel management for a, um, which is rarely given for a female only hiring. Um, we're in a competitive, so we're in a competitive service. So that means, you could have uh, 25 slots and 975 of them are females applying and 25 are, are men. But whoever comes out of the funnel first is the one who gets the job, right? Because it's just the way the system works, okay? So uh, so Homeland Security Investigations, Force, force Removal Operations, both under our organization, have the authority to go out and recruit and hire uh, females only on the announcement. And um, that has helped us increase um, our female applicant flow. But one of the things we discovered, because I, like Jay, I, I got asked to head up this, you know, research on why we're not hiring females and keep and retain females. One of the things we found was uh, the academy process was also an issue as well. Uh, we would send, uh, you know, fill an academy class and only have one or two females in the academy class. And so the support set, you know, you'd like to believe everybody's supporting each other, but there are certain aspects of training where um, having more females to, to talk to and to, and to uh, uh, work through some issues uh, would, would, would have benefited um, um, the class. So um, we have a task force right now in both of our law enforcement uh, directorates um, made up of females at all levels, which is important as well. So at the senior executive level, all the way down to uh, the initial entry level that are looking at things that are specific to um, uh, female law enforcement officers and uh, how we can address them to both attract um, females, recruit uh, females, hire females, and most importantly, retain them. The other piece of this then also is promoting them. And that's another aspect we're looking at too, because we can't just promote you. I can't just say, Jay, I like you, I'm promoting you. You know, Jay has to want to be promoted, first of all, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that means you're moving. And that means you have to move family. And that, that everybody has to address that. You know, the reason I, I turned my gun in was because I became a single parent. So we have decisions we have to make, um, you know, to, to that are, 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 are greater than the job, right? So how do you get folks to, um, to not just get, get in the job, but stay in the job and then promote up so that we have um, females and a, a diversity across the board, um, both gender and, and nationality, race, you know, across the board as they, as they move up, uh, up the ranks into the senior executive. I appreciate that you both answered that for me. Thank you so much. And it'll help me when students ask me some of these questions and I can point them in the right direction. So thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to, I want to end there, right, on that note, and I want to thank you all so much. You have taught me a great deal, and I have no aspirations in law enforcement, but I feel so much more prepared to answer questions when students come my way, and now I have new resources that I can point them in the direction um, of you gentlemen or you know, the, at least the air marshal service, which is something that they don't always think about as federal law enforcement. Um, and I am just so in gratitude for your time, for your energy. I always say you can spend an hour anywhere and you chose to spend it with us at John Jay. And for that, I thank you. I wish you a wonderful evening. Be safe, stay well. And I hope that this is just the first of many conversations. 
And Bray, you're the best. Thank you so much for introducing our community to these gentlemen. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, thank you, Roseanne. Uh, and thank you, gentlemen. And uh, closing note, uh, December 11th, go Army. Go Army. Go Army. <laughs> <laughs>